Welcome to the Krishna Das Pilgrim Heart Hour. In this podcast, Krishna Das shares his warm-hearted and down-to-earth path to the divine. If you are interested in supporting Krishna Das's podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash KD. I don't know. I think it all comes down to how do we get what we really want. We think we want a lot of things, and sometimes we wind up getting them only to find out that it's not quite what we thought, to say the least. So many programs running inside of us, so many needs, so many desires, so many versions, so many stories about ourselves that we tell ourselves that we don't like, then we don't like that we don't like, and on and on. A lot of people don't believe that there's anything to find, you know. So they go through life, get born, go to school, drink beer and die. That's it. Next. So if by some strange, weird circumstance we actually find ourselves thinking about life, That's pretty cool. That already is the fruit of our own previous karmas. Nothing comes from nothing. It certainly does. And something only comes from something. Everything comes from certain causes, and and then it itself becomes a cause of something else. So if right now we find ourselves looking for something in life, <clears throat> that's the effect of, of previous causes, of our own actions and some, some whatever. I mean, you don't have to believe in reincarnation. You don't have to believe in rebirth. That's not required. I don't necessarily believe it. Uh, it sounds e- reasonable to me considering the weird shit I've seen in life on different parts of this planet, but that's that's my problem, not yours. But still, why would you be looking for something and somebody else not? Like I was, <clears throat> every month or so, I go out to dinner with a group of six or seven high school friends. High school, we're talking. <laughs> I think that was when we still live in uh, stick houses and woods Um, and uh, we've been doing this for years and just a few a few months ago one of the people in the group they know me they actually came I brought all 20 uh, at one point a few years ago I brought about 20 25 of my high school friends to the kirtan we do in uh, the church on the upper west side (laughs) They, they took up a whole row I made them all stand up Everybody applauded them, and they were like, (laughs) they didn't know if they were being initiated into the cult, if they'd ever be allowed to leave or what, you know? It's just seeing the look on their faces. It was great. (laughs) Worth the price of admission. Anyhow, so they knew how crazy I am, but they've never said anything. So finally, just a few months ago, one of the the people looked at me and said, you know, why did you go to India? That was the first time they ever really asked me a real question about my life. We should be just together. I watch them get drunk and fall over in their food and then I drive home. <laughs> no, just just kidding. They don't get drunk. Well, they don't fall over in their food. <laughs> much. So, I mean, there's so much love at the table, it's ridiculous. Even though we hardly seen each other for 50 years. But those are the kids that I grew up with. Some of them from elementary school. Anyhow, so this woman said to me, you know, why'd you go to India? So, you know, I I said, well, you know, 
I always felt that I was missing something. I, I, you know, there was something in my life that was just missing, and I just felt kind of out of place, and I just I felt I had to find something, that, you know. And she just, and very naturally, very simply said, really, I never felt that. <laughs> oh, you know, right, right. She'd never felt it. So she didn't look, she didn't go, and I mean, she's an amazing person. She's dealing with a lot of physical stuff, very intense physical stuff, really powerful person. But she just didn't feel that longing, right? Or if she did, she didn't, couldn't imagine that you could really find that, right? You know? Or she imagined that if she looked in certain places, she would find it. But, she, but you don't find it in those places. So, but it was a very poignant moment, you know. There was nothing I could say. I mean, what do you say? Uh, you know. So the conversation just meandered along different topics. But it was, you know. I thought about all the people I knew. And where they've gone, what's happened to them, you know, and uh, just kind of heartbreaking, you know. You pretty much get one shot at it a lifetime. One lifetime at a time. One life at a time. And uh, it would probably be good to do the best we could. Whatever that is, we are doing the best we can. That's the other thing. Everybody's doing the best they can, which is interesting. We may not think it's good enough, right? We may think, oh, they should be doing this, but we don't know. They're doing the best they can. All we can be concerned about is our own actions. When I first met Ramdas, when I walked into the room where he was sitting, immediately, without a word being spoken, without even eye contact, just walking into the room, I knew inside of me that whatever it was I was looking for was real. It was real. It existed. It was in the world. It could be found. Then I really got depressed. <laughs> Because if it was real and it was in the world and could be found, fuck it, I hadn't found it. Now what? Uh, but uh, that was a big moment for me because that we're talking about ancient history now. Right? There were three books on this stuff. There were no yoga centers. There was maybe two yoga teachers in the whole country. And... Uh, so you read these books like uh, Gospel of Ramakrishna and Autobiography of a Yogi, and you think, wow. But then you think, oh, it's a book. You know, you don't really know whether it's real or not. But when I walked into that room, I knew it was real. It was real, and it could be found. You see, that's the thing. You really can find this. Because it's not, the, the, the joke's on us, it's not outside of us. That's, that's the kicker. So we can find this because it's who we are. It's our own true nature. It's, there's something that lives within us that is who we really are, what we really are, underneath all the stories we tell ourselves, all the stories other people tell us, all the things we believe even about life, Underneath all that, there's something, our true nature. And all we have to do is uncover it. No problem, right? Yeah. Right. So the, that's the good news and the bad news. The good news is nobody can give it to you. Nobody has to give it to you. You can't, you don't need to get it from somebody else. The bad news is you can't. <laughs> the good news is you can find it if you look. The bad news is you ain't going to find it if you don't look.
So that's the deal. Now, Maharaji used to say, my guru, Neem Karoli Baba, he used to say, Ram Nam Karnase Sabpura Hojata, which means from going on repeating these names of God that we've been chanting, everything is brought to fullness and completion. From continually and going on chanting these names, everything is brought to fullness and completion. It's a ripening process. I've never learned anything in my life, but due to my uh, stubborn nature and my low tolerance for pain, I've dragged myself out into the sun to be ripened a few times. And I got lucky there, might, there weren't any clouds that day. So it's a ripening process. You, you add these practices to your life as your life is. And it changes from the inside out. It changes naturally. It's a natural process of ripening. Ripening is a natural process. Fruits get ripe in the right circumstances. So when we expose ourselves to the sunlight of these teachings, of these practices, of the, uh, the lives of these really great beings, it ripens our hearts. And then that kind of, you ever bite a peach that was about two weeks away from being ripe? Yucky. Well, that's what's kind of the way we taste these days. But as we ripen, that gets very sweet and very juicy because it's its nature. That's the way it tastes when it's ripe. And that, that's the way our hearts are. As they ripen, we get sweeter. And our lives get sweeter. And all the people that used to piss us off don't piss us off anymore. We just smile. That's nice. <laughs> that reminds me of one time when I was on tour down south. And uh, me and my friend were at a little coffee shop getting a cup of coffee and he telling this dirty joke right and there was this kind of older woman behind it in those days there were older people <laughs> I don't know what happened to all the older people they've all gone <laughs> it's really weird <laughs> so anyhow there was this older woman behind the counter and I got embarrassed I really that she'd hurt us talking and I said uh, I apologize for our our, our language and she said oh that's all right my grandmother told me how to say fuck you down here so <laughs> i said well really how do you say it we just say isn't that nice <laughs> isn't that nice <laughs> well, I forgot where I was, so that's the story. Any questions or anything? Questions? Questions, comments, observations, criticisms, you can keep to yourself. <laughs> Hi. So this is really weird, so I'm just going to put it out there. Sometimes when I'm chanting the name of Ram, it tastes like mazuka honey. M manuka it tastes like honey. Honey, yeah. In the mouth, it yeah. actually physical taste. Uh, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, makes you just chant more. Nah, it, you just lost the taste. Ah, uh, it, well, it makes you like it. That's just no. Enjoy it. It'll uh -huh. come. Uh huh. It'll go. Mm -hmm. And it'll come. And it'll go. So that's but, the thing. I'm not like. Yeah. I don't have like a tumor or something. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you better ask a doctor that. Uh -huh. Uh, those things happen. Lots of things happen. But the whole idea is any experience will come, and all experiences come, and they go. If you hang on to them, you just killed it. You know, so it didn't get there by you trying to make it happen. It came of its own, so it'll come and go on its own. Your job, our job, is to remember the name. 
when I say remember, it means to pay, you know, be, stay aware of the of the chanting that's going on, either quietly or outside. In India, they call it bhajan or remembering. It's a very beautiful phrase. It implies something we already know that we've temporarily forgot, not something we're getting from the outside that we never heard of before. We're remembering. So putting, you know, remembering, putting together with the name. So just keep keep the chant going, keep, keep the mantra going, the practice going. And um, yeah, you know, it, it's not a bad thing. It's, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really mean much of anything. But it's nice. It's better than uh, lemons or, you know, or something else, you know, right? Um, a lot of stuff comes and goes. Actually, the whole point of practice is to not get lost in our fascination for experience. Because that's where we live from one experience to the other, one reaction to the other, all life long. So the whole point of practice is to release us from that obsessive clinging to these experiences that come and go, that we want, that we don't want, we hang on to, or we push away. We want to get behind those reactions so that we can just let them be. Whatever comes can come, whatever goes can go. So, um, but it takes, they call it practice for a good reason. You know, you got to do it. But try to remember, it's not about trying to achieve some particular f feeling or some taste even, or some, some high. Anything you can manufacture with your own personal effort is going to disappear. It's going to come and it's going to go. What we're trying to do is remain in the awareness of, in this case, the name going on, either quietly or out loud. You, you don't push it away. Hi, how you doing? Hmm, tastes good, Ram. You know. Yeah. You can pass the mic around. Uh, what is it that you saw in Ram Das? Was it his uh, beard? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I mean, his uh, sweetness, his secret smile, his light, his. Uh, it was none of that. I hardly even saw him. I just walked into the room and I got hit with that. Yeah. After that, you know, I got closer to him. I got to know him better because I thought it was him at first, and uh, he had a hard time uh, divesting me of that belief, so to speak. And by the time he did, I realized it was coming from Maharaji. And so then I went to India to be with Maharaji. But I spent about a year and a half with Ramdas here in the States, you know, learning a lot of things, hearing about all this stuff and hearing about Maharaji and hearing about his experiences in India. And it was his, it was his being, you know. It, it, there was a real sense of... Uh, Just being here, you know, really just here. Wasn't grabbing at things, and he was just here, and he was, he was inviting us into that space. It was wide open space, and so it was wonderful. Of course, later we found out that Maharaji had told them not to talk about him when he sent them back to America. But all he could do was talk about him. You remember when you fell in love, you know? You couldn't even, you stopped eating, you know. You didn't even watch TV for 10 minutes because you were thinking about that person you were in love with. So that's what it was like. He couldn't stop, you know, just exuding the perfume of Maharaji, you know, the taste, the feeling. And of course, Maharaji would say, he's doing nothing, that's Ram, that's God coming through. I would know what God says. But that's just the way it is. So it wasn't anything particular other than it was a, the the sense of being and openness and wide space and and there was a there was a, a humor and a sweetness in it too of course so he's um he's bathed to, in grace and unblocked 
Excuse it was unblocked pretty much, and so oh. it's crazy. In a couple of small little areas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, uh, he, his whole life has been a seeker and done a lot of work on himself over the years. But he got, something was planted within him when he met Maharaji, or was awakened, so to speak. And he's been, to this day, he's, he lives to honor that, that presence within. And he goes through more in a day than uh, I'll go through in 20 lifetimes. He's in really, he's been in a wheelchair for 20 years. Major stroke, cat catastrophic stroke, as they call it. And it's just got so much bodily pain and, un and, but he's like right with it. You know, he's overcome pride. He has to get, he can't, he's got two torn rotator cuffs from falling, so he can't turn himself in bed. There's got to be somebody there 24 7 available and this is from a guy who you know was a very uh, alpha kind of being you know he did for himself he took care of himself he was out there you know and now he he, he can't get through the a minute without somebody there so he's overcome though all the all the hum the, the 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 what do you call it the, he's got true humility about it all it's beautiful he's such a be in such a beautiful space i often say to him you know ah oh, you finally become who we thought you were 40 years ago <laughs> and he just laughs ah <laughs> yeah it felt like coming home you know it felt like it was right you know i met a couple of other swamis and a couple of teachers before that but I had not got any hit. This was, you know, this was obviously, I'm still talking about it. It brought me to India, brought me back, back and forth. And all this is coming from Maharaji. So obviously it was, I found myself in the right place. Hello. Hello. Uh, so I've got a question for you too. Um, <clears throat> you were talking about the process of, of ripening, like a fruit ripens and becomes sweet. Uh, and that makes it sound a little bit like it's something passive that just happens, which in some extent that may be true. There's something, there's grace. But my question is, when a fruit is ripening, um, we have some role to play in that. If I want to grow tomatoes, I have to uh, plant it when it's the right temperature. Mm -hmm. I have to weed yeah. it. I have to fertilize the soil. And then the tomato, I can't make it ripen. It ripens just on its own. That's its nature. Yeah. But I have some role to play in the tomatoes that are coming up in my garden. So for our own ripening, is there some role to play or is it simply passive? Let me repeat what Maharaji said. From repeating the name, everything is brought to fullness and completion. That's your role. Repeat the name. Do the japa do the repetition of the name, do the meditation, the chanting. That's what ripens. That's the action you take in this, in this small little right. image. Uh, I'm thinking of like the yamas and the niyamas, though. Aren't those a foundation also for the ripening? Or uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm getting it too, make, getting it, make no, it too no, complicated. No. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. Not at all too complicated. Um, everybody, you all know what yamas and niyamas are? An Ashtanga Yoga, Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga, there are eight limbs. The first two are Yama and Niyama, which means that I, I probably get it right. If I get it wrong, I wouldn't be surprised though. Because anyway, so Yama and Niyama are the do's and the don'ts. The good things you have to do to help yourself and the negative things that you shouldn't do that would bring upon obstacles to your path. It's a, these are the purification, the purification before you can even begin to really move inside, you have to get your shit together a little bit. And that means you have to stop harming people and things and yourself. And you, and you just have to start having some f compassion, caring for other things, etc. There's a whole list of them. I never, probably never actually read the whole list. But that's the idea. And then there's asana, pranayama, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, and etc. All that stuff. Pratyahara. See? Hey. Unbelievable. However, that's Ashtanga Yoga, the eight limb path. Maharaji said, as Westerners, 
we were actually only qualified for panchatanga yoga, the five-limbed yoga, which in Hindi was gup ghumne kane pine and sone. Somebody speaks Hindi. <laughs> it means gossiping, wandering around, drinking tea, eating, and sleeping. <laughs> this embodies all the yamas and the yamas. All the eight limbs are embodied in those five limbs because that's what we were qualified for. <laughs> um, absolutely. Every action you do, every thought you have is a karma that creates more karmas. If you go around uh, being a nasty schmuck and hurting people and creating anger and fear wherever you go, how, what kind of atmosphere do you think you live in? Just that kind of atmosphere. And more than that, you yourself won't be able to change your behavior. You think you're making decisions but actually, the decisions are making you. If you really look at what's going on. Like, it's, it's, as, it's as basic as if you eat something and you like the taste. You didn't decide to like that taste. It just, boom, right? It's very much like that when we think we're making decisions in life. We're actually going along with something that already feels that we have to do it. Because we don't really know what we're doing. We don't even know where we are. We don't know who we are. How are we going to make a decision, right? A conscious, fully aware decision is not possible. Only an enlightened being can do that. So what we start with is trying to do good things and trying not to do harmful things. Very simple. Not easy, by the way. Not easy. Not easy. We have no control over our emotions, our thoughts, or feelings. You push the right button, you get an explosion. Yeah, just don't give a yogi some money sometime. He'll kill you. You see, that? there was once some, some yogi going through the streets and he's going, you know, good luck, you know. So to really clean the heart, clean the mirror of the heart, the heart is like a mirror, or let's say, for instance, I look out at you, right? I see all of you. I see what you're wearing. I see how you're sitting. I see how your hair goes like this, or like this, or like this, or there's nothing there to go anywhere. And I have my, you know, I, I, without even thinking about it or being aware, I have a storyline built up around who you are, and I don't know you really right and so based on that storyline that i'm not really conscious of i re i act with you but it's based on a subtle belief about you are who you who i think you are but you're not you're already who you are you're not who i think you are but i go through my day every day acting based on what i think is out there not what's really out there because i'm seeing it through a very, uh, I'm projecting onto the screen my stuff. This is desirable, this is not desirable. I want this, I don't want that. All day long, all life long. So through practice, you could say that that stuff, that, that stuff that we're projecting is like dust on the mirror of our awareness. And as we clean our hearts, that layer of dust gets thinner and thinner so that when, as we look into that mirror, what we see is more accurate. And finally, we see our own true face. Fine, at the, you know, when we're finished cleaning it. So all these practices are to clean that heart and to purify our mo motives of our actions too. You know, two, a two actions can look the same but be very different, you know. Uh, so, and two people can have the same response, look apparently the same response to something, but their subjective experience is completely different. So you're right, there's a lot that we do, but you need to drop an anchor into the water. Otherwise, you have no leverage. You can't think yourself 
out of a prison that's made of thought. Every thought is the prison, is the prison. So through practice, we drop an anchor. You can't pick yourself up like this. There's no leverage. But through practice, where we're training ourselves to let go of the thoughts and emotions and reactions, not judge them, but simply let go and come back to the, to the mantra or whatever practice we're doing, we're gaining a, a tremendous amount of inner strength and reprogramming ourselves that, to not have those strong obsessive reactions every time the same. It takes a while. If it happens too fast, they put you away. You know, boom, you're away. Got padded cell. So the real changes happen very slowly. And you don't get to do a trip on them because we are what has to go. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Who we think we are is what has to go. That's the joke. You know? So we can clean the mirror of our hearts through a lot of different ways. But what's going to go is who we think we are. So for instance, Ramakrishna, who was a great saint, lived in the 1800s. He described how a practice like chanting works. Right? He said that every repetition, every single repetition of one of these names has juice, has energy, has power. And every single repetition is a seed. Every single repetition of one of these names is a seed that gets planted in our mind stream, in our hearts. And it's like throwing seeds up in the air and some of them get caught by the wind and they land on a roof of an old house in the middle of the jungle, right? And in those days, the roofs were made sometimes of clay that was just baked in the sun. And so the seeds of the repetitions of the name get caught between the tiles on this roof. Over time and years and seasons coming and going and wind and rain and sun, the tiles begin to break down. And then those seeds take root in the soft, what was a hard tile is now soft earth of the roof of the house. The seeds take root and they start to grow. And what's growing once again is every repetition of one of these names. Those seeds grow and they grow and they destroy the roof of the house. And they continue to grow and they wind up destroying the walls of the house. Ramakrishna says that old house is who we think we are. Let's go through it again. Every repetition of one of these names is a seed. So when certain causes and conditions arise, those seeds can take root. For instance, if you're going, Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Ram, and you're, like, you're typing, Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Ram, Ram, you're writing, your blah, 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 or you're watching TV, Shri Ram, Jai The seed's not going to get planted too deeply. It's, let's face it, right? You know? But if you, if you have some some intention to be quiet, quiet the mind and pay attention, maybe some uh, devotion would arise or something like that, then the seed gets planted a little more, a little differently and so it'll grow differently. So these, some of these seeds land on the roof of this old house, which is us, and they just sit there and they germinate, they wait until the right causes and conditions arise, then they start to sprout. Of course, this is something that's always going on not all at once. And they, the root, they start to root, and they destroy the roof of the house. They keep growing. And then they destroy the walls of the house. So there's nothing there anymore. What is there, what the house did, was separate, make a separation between inside and outside. Right? There's inside the house, there's the walls, and then there's what's outside the house. Right? Now, where did this house come from? Was it there since the beginning of time? No. It's a construction. It got made by our karmas. And there's an inside, a me, and there's an outside, everything else. 
when the walls are gone, there's only everything. All of it. There's only absolute, complete openness and presence. Vast space. Our own true nature. The walls were created. And they created an, a me and a you. There's only us. Or not really, but for figures speaking. So there isn't me and you. There's just the space in which we all exist. And as soon as all our walls are broken down, then there's no me anymore. There's just I. There's ultimate presence, being, which is love, which is compassion, which is truth, which is our true nature. So that's how it works. And you notice he didn't say, oh, it's going to feel like this, or it's going to feel like that. There's no concern about that. You do the practice, you live your life, and you allow it to work from within. You don't sit around writing a diary every day. Well, today I made it for 20, meditated for 29 minutes. For the first minute and 32 seconds, it felt pretty good, but then my knee started to hurt. And then after 4 minutes and 33 seconds, I was able to move my leg a little bit. So I, forget it. Who's meditating? Nobody. So that's not about what you feel. It, do the practice, get on with your life, and stop. Don't obsess about it. And in the meantime, you know those posters, Expose Yourself to Art? Expose yourself to the path. You know, see what this is about. Get an idea for what this is about and, and why great beings, what they've overcome to, to, to be here for us, actually. But that's a whole other thing. So how does that feel? Are you okay? Want to say more? Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I never got past the first yama. That was the problem. <laughs> yama one. Ah, it's too much. Hi, uh, is uh, Ramdas suffering? You'd have to ask him. Is he in pain? Is there pain? Yeah. Is there tremendous discomfort and and uh, physical pain? Yeah, a lot. Is he suffering? Well, that's a subjective reality that you have to speak to him about. There's a difference. Right? No? Oh, yeah? You know. You know, like, you know, it's like, say, the beauty of the space that he's in now is for the most part, he isn't suffering, even though He's experiencing extraordinary amounts of pain and discomfort, physical, and even some emotional. But still, he's so uh, deeply turned towards Maharaji at this point in his life that it encompasses all that. And instead of happening to him, it happens within him. It's very different. And he's not unique. That that is also could be the story for all of us at some point that uh, well anyway we'll get there or not anybody else? pass it over or whatever okay you can slip her 50 rupees if you really want to have a good question <laughs> Hi. Hi. This is lovely. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I, I am a singer. I've been a singer my whole life. I make my living that way. Sorry um, to hear that. I know. Well, that's why I want to talk to you. You know how you <laughs> you know how you call a singer in New York if you want to sing her. Uh, yeah. Well. Waiter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Waitress. <laughs> and and here's and here's I think why I want to. I've never had to do that. That's good. Very good. Yeah. And why do I hate it much? And that's where I think that, and it's a weird place to be. I've been doing it my whole life, and I feel like I've been serving something other than what I love about it. Serving, that's, that's what a waitress I, does. That's what I feel like. I feel like I'm, I do. I feel like a slave to this thing that I don't love anymore, but it used to be what I love more than anything. Mm. And I heard your voice today, and 
it made me feel like I want to make people feel like I hope I make people feel with my voice. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I've been using it, even though it's made me money, mm -hmm. in the way that is gonna is going to make me feel like I've done something useful. I don't know. I've lost the plot, and I really don't even know what the question is. I just feel like I've got this thing that God gave me, and I'm I've been using it, and it's been it served me in some ways. But mm -hmm. I don't feel I want to keep doing it, but I don't know. I don't know how. It's a great place to be in. Mm, really, it's a very good place. In other words, something you've done kind of on automatic. Uh, it doesn't f seem to fit anymore, but so that's great. That's a wonderful place to be in. Good luck. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the question is. I think maybe it's. I think maybe it's. Um, I just how answered the, music, the question. Yeah, how did music find? <laughs> how did it find you, and how did this 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 find you doing this type of music? And well, uh, we had learned. To, we had started singing in India uh, because it was a way to express, to give some uh, I don't even want to use the word expression, but to, like to open a channel for our love to flow, you know, out and just to flow open. And also it was a way to uh, bribe Maharaji to let us spend more time with him. And that worked very well. Uh, then he left the body and he sent me back to America and uh, I, I didn't sing. Uh, we were singing a little bit with people that we knew from the old days in India. But uh, but then uh, it, I was in a very um, negative and destructive uh, mode of life at that time, yeah, very unhappy. And uh, I was especially depressed. And it was almost 20 years after he died. And uh, I was in my room, and uh, I just walked out from one room to the other, and I was really struck by the understanding that if I didn't sing with people, then it was with people, unfortunately. If I didn't sing with people, I would never be able to clean out the dark corners and the shadows in my own heart. Sing with people this way, chanting. Uh, you know, terrific. I, I just kind of, well, okay. But I avoided it for a long time. And then, uh, then I kind of recognized I better get with the program or nothing was going to happen. So I started doing that. But there was no, you know, program. There was no plan. I just started singing at Jiva Mukti on Monday nights. David and Sharon used to give uh, little satsangs. So there were about 10 people there. And uh, so I would sing for 20 or 30 minutes, and then they would take questions and answers and stuff. And that went on for a couple of months. And then I came one Monday, and they were, they were gone. They'd gone to India. So I sang for a couple hours. And more people started to come. More and more people started to come. And after they were gone for almost three months, I think, at that time. And they came back. One day I walked in and I saw they were back. And we talked, hi, how are you doing? And now there's three Christians in front instead of the one they're sitting there. So I started my singing like I always did. And I forgot they were there. And I, after like about 45 minutes, I went, oh, shit, right? And I looked over at them like, <laughs> and they kind of just looked at each other and just went, and here we are, just like that. It just happened, you know. Right. You know, the whole thing is to find out what you want to do. That's all. Nobody can tell you. And there's not one method to, to apply to get the answer. There's no one button to push. You've got to live. So good luck. Hey. hey, I am a vocalist too. I'm, I'm mostly a vocalist and a singer these days. Um, <clears throat> I was curious, as uh, my intellect is curious, of uh, the change in the melodies in the chanting. Um, what the uh, what the goal is? The changing the melody, or is it is it fluid? Can it change? Um, how does it change? 
What is there a is there an all, all of the above is the of, answer to that? Um, I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know either. Uh, <laughs> How does it come? How does it, it come? It, it, well, it <laughs> just comes, just like vomit comes, you know. There's, 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 there's no really no thought behind it. <laughs> yeah, but you create, like, albums. <laughs> I I, I, I've learned to vomit in tune, that's all, you know. <laughs> For hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's really very little thought behind it. It's more like a f I just close my eyes and go. Um, if I had to think about it, which you're asking me to do, I would say the changes in the melodies come, they serve a purpose to keep us more interested, keep us paying attention, because we're wandering. Even while we're singing, we're hardly here, right. if we really look. But if the melodies are changing, then we have to pay a little bit of attention to what we're singing. If it was all go, you know, it'd be easy to just think of a lot of other things without, but the melodies change uh, also to keep me interested, you know? Are so, harmonies allowed? Absolutely not. <laughs> sure. Sing, sing your ass off, just but whatever you like. But don't get caught in sing, trying to make it beautiful. You know, that's not the point. The point is to pay attention. There, you can do this practice even if you can't carry a tune. It's not a musical practice. There's music involved, but what, it's a meditation practice. And by that I mean it's about paying attention. And it's about ultimately bringing the mind, quieting the mind and bringing it to one point and getting a vote. And through that, being able to bring the mind to one point, one begins to get a vote how one goes through one's day. In other words, when somebody steps on your toe, instead of getting out your Uzi and slaughtering them, you there's a there's a minute where you or, or a second where you can first of all see if they did it on purpose, trying to hurt you, or whether they just didn't see you. I mean, there's a whole array of things that can happen if you don't have a knee jerk reaction. And that's what we're trying to do because we go through our whole day. It's just a knee-jerk life, the whole thing. So the idea is to slow down a little bit, and this is a way to do it. And yeah, that's 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 the whole thing. So you know, and I'm doing the same thing you're doing. I'm not trying to do anything for you or to you. I, I'm doing my practice too. We're doing it together. Uh, you need me to lead and I need you to to answer so I don't go home and watch TV all day. If you're here, I can't watch TV. But I can record what I want to see later. <laughs> um, hey, Krishna Das. Hi. Love you. Hey, hi. Hey, um, can you tell us about some really rocking places to um, see you perform? Some places that maybe um, show up on your calendar and you're just like have them circled and like, wow, this place really people get like super ecstatic. And uh, places, places, places that you that you love to perform as, as my it my bathroom is one of those. Right? <laughs> I perform every day. I, I re first of all, I don't even know where I'm going next. But I'll be there sooner or later. Um, I, I'm going to Bhakti Fest from here, despite the fact that it's too hot for human beings to actually live. <laughs> After that, I, I don't know. You just check the schedule. I, it's all uh, it's all the same to me. So I don't know what to tell you. Whoever I am, whoever I'm singing with, it's the same. Exactly the same. Even in India, which scared me. When I walked out in the first time I sang in Mumbai, I wasn't really paying attention, you know. The, the promoter organized this thing in this hall. and I, You know, I didn't ask any questions. I just, yeah, so they drove me over there. I should have had a clue when I looked up on, and I saw a huge billboard with my face on it in Mumbai. I said, what the? Are you kidding me? Take that down. Anyway, so I walked into this theater and I walked down on stage. 
there were 2,000 people in this theater. Old Ma's, little kids, the techie crowd, the drinking crowd, the party crowd. Everybody, there was, everybody was there. I said, what are you doing here? Go away, you know? It was crazy. Uh, you know, go home. India has so many kirtan walls. What are you doing? Ah, we love you. Okay. And it was really hard because they knew every word of every song and every joke. <laughs> they study YouTube like it's higher math or something. <laughs> I would start one little shtick and they were already laughing. I was like, this is terrible. <clears throat> so I don't know what to tell you. I just go sing. It's all the same to me. And uh, wherever I am. Yeah. Can you say... Um, I know you obviously have an extreme connection to um, Neem Karoli Baba, but when you... Um, I'm glad it's obvious. When, when you met um, Swami Satchidananda, mm -hmm. did, did you um, have some of that same feeling, or can you have any um, story about Swami Satchidananda? Uh, in those days, Swami Satchidananda was the only Swami around. And uh, I went to see him. And I went, stood in line, and I asked him, uh, he to, you know, to meet him. And, and he said, what's your question? And I said, I don't know. He said, well, when you figure it out, come back. I said, okay. And I haven't gone back yet. <laughs> but I did go back, actually. I got invited to sing in Yogaville, which is his ashram in Virginia. <clears throat> the first time I went, he was still alive at that time. It's a funny story. And uh, so we were going to sing in the same hall that he was to give his lecture later in the evening. So I've been instructed very, very, uh, how shall I say, intensely, <laughs> that once he came out into the room, I would be singing, and he would come into the room and sit in his chair below the stage, the minute he came out into the room, I had only seven minutes more to sing, and then I had to stop. Okay, I can do that. So we're singing along, singing along, and the, you know, the, I'm just about to start Namashivaya, the last last song I was going to sing, and he walks out, and I said, "Oh, okay, uh, all right." So now I said, "We're going to do a 25-minute Namashivaya in seven minutes." And he laughed, and he laughed. I mean, he got it. Nobody else did, but he got it. <laughs> and he just said, no, no, you sing, you sing, you sing. You keep singing. Don't worry. You sing. So we did our Namashiva, and we got off. And then, uh, so then he came up on stage, and he was really lit up. And he just said, oh, this was so great. This was so great. I haven't heard singing like this since Woodstock. He said. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> and then I swear, he said, this is all you need. Devotion is everything. It's the whole thing. All you need is to sing and chant and sing. We love. But you know, you have to do some asana, pranayama. <laughs> he was giving the shop away, you know. And he just said, oh, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> but he, he made me promise to come back, you know. And so I, I go back there every year. Uh, he was very sweet, very sweet. But no, I didn't feel any connection with him when I met him at all. I mean, there was, of course, respect and curiosity. There weren't a lot of swamis around. Uh, and then <laughs> the other thing was, uh, I thought, maybe, well, I should learn some Hatha yoga, right? They're teaching it. So I went to this apartment on the Upper West Side and where they had this yoga class. And so I was greeted at the door. I said, guy can, hello, my name is Hardy. I said, hi, Harry. And he goes, no, Hardy. That was my last yoga class. You know, it's not so easy to drop the bullshit, you know? Usually we just give it another name and walk along like it's somebody else, but it's still us in there being stupid. So the idea is to do the work, put the practice in, do a little bit every day, 
Get used to the feeling of letting go a little bit. That's all we're talking about here. Get used to sitting down and doing nothing. It's not easy. Give yourself five minutes where you really just turn your phone off and you just sit there. Repeat some mantra if you like. Watch your breath come and go. Watch your mind go all over the place. Don't try anything. Don't try for five minutes a day. See what happens. It's a big, that's a big five minutes. I mean, if you could do five seconds, you could probably levitate and fly up to the sky. It's a big thing not to do anything. Not easy. You can sit still, but your mind is all over the place. And you can't, where is that mind that you're going to grab it and kill it? You can't. It's not like a carnival. There, where goes the mind? Oh, I want a little dolly. No, it's not like that. You have to kind of get used to letting go. And that's called mind training, believe it or not. This is every, every spiritual practice centered on this, be able to pay attention. We can't pay attention. We can't pay, you know, many years ago, uh, Ram Das and I and a group of people were up in, at, uh, this before India, we were up at the Lama Foundation in New Mexico. And we were doing a, like a month-long retreat up there. And uh, while we were up there, we had heard about a New York artist named Herman who had been to India and learned to meditate and was now living just below Lama, you know, about a mile or so down the mountain. And so, the, and he would let people come to visit with him. And so we got on a car one day, about five or six of us, and we went to visit him. We came in, and he was very nice, and I kind of was just sitting in the back, you know. Everybody else was asking questions. I didn't ask any questions. I was just listening. So then we were leaving, and I was the last one out the door, and he stopped me at the door. And I turned, and he looked at me, and he said, you, you have to find out why it is you can't give yourself completely, 100% to whatever it is you're doing. You ever see one of those squirrels in a, <clears throat> in a taxidermist nailed to the wall? You know, it's like, he just nailed me to the wall. I'm um, today, I can feel it right now. Same way I felt, he saw through me and he said, you, you have to find out why you can't give yourself 100% to whatever you're doing. That's the whole deal, ladies and gentlemen. If we could do that, we have nothing else to think about. That's the whole deal. Now, I'm not just talking about getting immersed in something for a short period of time. I'm talking about having freedom to be wherever you are without getting pulled away at any time. So that's where all these practices are aiming at and what they're all aiming at doing is to allow us to sit in there, in our own being, without getting splashed around the whole universe all the time. So, but you know, I just got to say, you can't just sit down and do that, bring your mind to one point. It doesn't, you can't. It's just not possible, which is what yama and niyama are about. If you don't start bringing some harmony into your daily life, into your inner life, into your emotional life, you're not going to be able to calm your mind. It's just not going to work. And even if you're able to bring your mind to one point and keep it there and enter into some kind of trance, it's just like a vacation, you know. You have to still have to pay the rent when you come back home. So that's not the goal. And even that's not easy. I mean, you could spend your whole life trying to do that, and, and, but that's not the goal. The goal is to be here, not to be gone. The mind is not destroyed in those, in those moments of uh, immersion and bliss 
or immerse in in one state or another. The mind is not so. It just recre. It just arises again the minute that the karmas that are holding it down are worked out, are are exhausted. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to hide. There's nothing you got to do except pay attention and uh, do a little practice. It won't hurt. We're all here, I think, collectively for very similar reasons. Um, Mating and dating? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean here, but also on the earth. We're all looking for something. And a lot of that, at least this weekend, has been about uh, a desire to connect with divinity and to find some answers in the process. Um, Why do you think, though, if you go back to your friend who you went to dinner with, who said, I've never felt that need. Mm -hmm. I personally think we do need that connection. It's not just a desire. It may be hidden for some. But why do you think we need to connect with God? You ever see a Quaker Oats commercial? (laughs) Shot out of a cannon? Quaker oats is supposed to have, they make it by shooting the oats out of a cannon. We're, we're the oats. We've been shot out of the cannon. We're going to land on the ground. That's the nature of things. That's the way it is. We, we come from unity, from oneness. We're in temporary illusion of separateness. It's a temporary illusion. It's just natural. That's the way it is. Period. Some of us feel it more intensely at one point or another. And some of us don't. That's okay. Everybody's different levels of, of, of need and wanting different things to fulfill different desires. Uh, it's just the way it is. It's, that's just that's the deal. And on the other hand, if you some philosophies say nothing ever happened. There is no there is no illusion. There is no world. There's only here, there's only oneness, you know. They tend to talk a little bit too much especially the the disciples of those people. But it's just the nature of the way this this is, you know. There is only one of us. When my guru died, left the body, and I ran around looking for him, I would go ask all these saints, you know, have have you seen my guru? You know, he left the body, and I know he's somewhere. They looked at me like I was crazy. They said, your guru is looking out of your eyes right now. What's looking out of your eyes is the same thing looking out of my eyes. It's the same thing looking out of every sentient being's eyes. Pure awareness, pure consciousness, pure being. That's who we are. The problem is that we think we are other things. So that thinking and those identifications with thoughts is what has to be released over time. That's, that's the deal. What do you think? So you're saying we all want to be oatmeal. <laughs> if, if there's raisins and cinnamon, yeah, sure. I, I'd rather be the raisins, personally, but, you know. But, yeah, no, I mean, it's just we're all... There's really only... There's, just like I said, the, the story of, of Ramakrishna's story. When the house... The houses are individual... The houses are who we think we are, created by our own karmas, this separate, this belief or this experience of separation, of separateness, meanness, right? When that's dissolved, there's only oneness everywhere at all times. There's no temporary, illusory separation. So... uh, because the space inside is not different than the space outside. It's just separated. The quality of space is the same. But it's separated from the inside and the outside. So as that's melted away, we, we experience a, a deeper reality. We experience what's already here. It's not something we add on. 
It's not something more we get. We recognize what's already there, what's already here underneath all our thoughts and all our identities, all our striving, all our needs, all our uh, personality stuff. It's the same one. And when we chant, those are the names of that place. They're all the names of the same place. So that's why it, it allows us to release our stuff. You know, if we thought, if we sang, um, oh, my baby left me and I felt so, I feel so bad, if we sang that like a hundred million times, we'd go kill ourselves. <laughs> you know? Because those concepts would, would torture us and, and we identify with it. But there's not, when we say Ram, we don't know what it means conceptually. Experientially, we will find out, we will experience what the real Ram is. Maharaji said, go on, sing your lying Ram Ram. Go on, sing your false Ram Ram. One of these days you say it right once, boom. You know? We're lying. We don't know what the real Ram is, but the real Ram is still here, even though we don't know it. The real Krishna is still here, even though we don't know it. Because they say also that the name and what is named, or the name and God, are not different. But we don't know that. We don't experience that. Because we think there's a me repeating the name. So we're not experiencing what the reality of the name is. But through repetition and gradually more and more immersion in the sound of the name, in the name, subpura hojata, everything is made full and complete. Through this practice, the things we need are give, brought to us and the things that aren't useful to us leave our life. We, we may not notice. We don't have to notice. We're not running the show. We just think we are. That's another thought. Mm -hmm.